Today, we are here to talk about the climate crisis. But first, we'd like to talk about you. I'd like all of you to think of and then shout out as loudly as you can whichever emotions come to mind when I pose this question. What do you feel when you think about the climate crisis? Let me hear your emotions. Fear. Frustration, anger, sadness, fear. Thank you so much. I can tell we're all feeling a lot of emotions, like fear, which is natural given the uncertain and, if nothing changes, potentially catastrophic future ahead of us. Some of us are feeling angry. Anger, perhaps directed at politicians or fossil fuel companies or past generations for their inaction. Some of you may feel tired, tired of this crisis or tired of us once again being on stage talking about it. Some of you may even feel guilty, guilt because you've recently taken a flight that could have been a train ride. But if you're anything like me, you'll feel overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the scale of the problem and by how little you may feel you can achieve. All of these emotions are valid and important because emotions can be a powerful tool for change. Whichever emotion is most prevalent for you, I think we can all agree that the climate crisis isn't just an ecological one. It's also an emotional crisis. But being fearful or overwhelmed can also paralyze us, which isn't very useful. So instead, in keeping with the theme for this conference, we need a culture of care when it comes to the climate. Care for our ecosystems and care for our fellow human beings who are already heavily affected by this crisis. Who cares? Well, we care. But Clara, why do we care? Well, why do I care? A Fridays for Future activist, a psychology student, a sister, an aunt, a human being. All of these aspects give me a reason to care. But I didn't always care. I haven't always been an activist. It actually took me quite a long time to become one. In 2019, all around the world, thousands of young people started taking the streets, demanding a future, demanding a just world. In Nigeria, South Africa, China, in the US, in Australia, yes, and even in Austria. But I, I wasn't there. I was skeptical. Will this actually change anything? Is protesting, demanding, shouting really the best way? Is it necessary? Months have passed, I was busy. I was busy becoming an adult, busy studying, busy finding new friends, busy finding a job, and struggling to pay my rent. I simply didn't have the time to become an activist. Others will take care of it. Politicians will take care of it, right? I mean, it is their job. The climate crisis is a problem that I knew. A couple of podcast papers, seminars, documentaries later, I knew it is bad. It is worse than I dare to imagine. Time is running out and no politicians are not taking care of it. The pandemic hit and everything changed. My older sister told us that she's pregnant and a big reason why I care was added to the list. Now I'm finally ready to become a climate justice activist. But doubts stormed my mind. Who am I to talk about the climate crisis? I'm not a scientist or an expert or most affected by the crisis. Do I know enough? But isn't the real question, will I ever know enough? I will never know everything about climate physics, climate policies, or the political system, or all the problems which are connected to this crisis, such as capitalism, colonialism, or racism. At this point, I realized time is running out, so I have to learn on the way. Because I know that the climate crisis makes extreme weather events such as floods, droughts, forest fires, heat waves more frequent and intense. 
And when I hear that in India and in Pakistan, extreme temperatures are endangering food and water supplies of millions of people, are endangering the poorest and elderly community, yes, then I fight with the tears. When I heard that the Marge's ski area is on fire, where there should be white snow, black smoke, and hot flames are raging, yes, then I don't look forward to the next summer. Images of the last summer pop into my head when fires were raging in Italy, Spain, and Greece, a flood disaster hit Germany, in China, people on the way to work drowned in the subway. Yes, then I experienced fear. Yes, and then, then I got also angry because I know another world is possible, because I know that we can be independent of this fossil fuel system, of this war financing fossil fuel system. Because I know that the solutions do not fail because of feasibility, but because of political will. But we, we can change this will. Yes, and then, then I get loud, because I know with pressure from the streets, with pressure from you and me, we can change the political will, as long as we don't stand still. Now I'm shouting at the top of my lungs with a megaphone in my hands. To me, to us, activism means not settling for being passive. In light of the crisis, we become active. We get involved, hold politicians accountable, raise awareness for the challenges that we face. In short, activism means to care. But why do you care, David? To me, care is built on understanding. When we understand, we care. But how will we understand the climate crisis? Too often, Climate science is inaccessible, with numbers buried in long reports, complex language, and visualizations that only very few people actually understand. In order for us to reach the societal threshold where political change becomes inevitable, making the climate crisis tangible for a broader group of people is crucial. We need a common vocabulary to describe this crisis. In short, we need to foster climate literacy. And so, just over a year ago, two fellow Fires of Future activists and myself started working on a climate dashboard. We began by collecting data sets from scientific institutions, like the Austrian Environmental Agency and from peer-reviewed journals. We then built a series of tools and visualizations that make the climate crisis tangible by making the underlying science accessible. Our website is structured into three categories. The challenging status quo, the effects of the climate crisis on the systems that surround us, ecological, economic, social, and the pathways towards a net zero world. First, let's look at the challenges we face. This graph shows Austria's annual emissions from 1990 until today and how they've changed. As you may notice, they haven't really changed at all, except for a few exceptional years, like the pandemic year 2020. Austria's emissions in the last 30 years have failed to decrease, remaining steady at around 80 million tons of greenhouse gases every single year. All the while, for the last 30 years, climate scientists have been ringing the alarm. They've been ringing the alarm because emissions aren't free. They come at a cost. And Austria's limit on how much we can spend is approaching rapidly. At the very, very, very latest, Austria needs to reduce its emissions to virtually zero by 2040, if we want to have any shot globally at keeping the climate crisis from escalating into a climate catastrophe. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that looks like quite a challenge. But it's only such a huge challenge because the last 30 years have gone to waste. And every additional year, without a decrease in emissions, will only make walking this path towards net zero 
ever more complicated. It's like walking down a hill. A very slight incline is manageable, but the steeper the incline becomes, the more likely you are to lose your footing, to start to slip, to start to fall, you start losing control on the way down. This is the challenge we're up against with the climate crisis, and time is running out. But of course, Austria is only part of the story. This is a global crisis. So let's zoom out from Austria to the global perspective. Looking at how greenhouse gas emissions from the dawn of industrialization until today, all summed up, are distributed across continents. As you can see, North America and Europe make up almost two-thirds of all historical emissions. Almost two-thirds. But of course, for the real perspective, let's look at how many people actually live in each continent. On the top, we've got share of global emissions. On the bottom, share of global population in the year 2020. As you can see, North America and Europe barely make up 20% of the world's population. And we've been emitting greenhouse gases like we are two-thirds of humankind. Greenhouse gas emissions are distributed unequally across the global community. And when you look at the continents that are most heavily affected by this crisis, like Latin America and Africa, you can see clearly that they aren't responsible for this crisis. We are. And so understanding the climate crisis also means understanding that this is a crisis of global justice. Numbers and figures are one important way to understand this crisis. Emotional and personal understanding is another way. We all probably have a similar understanding of what responsibility means. If you break something, it is your responsibility to fix it. You break it, you fix it. Simple as that. The global north has emitted far more emissions than its fair share. Simply said, we broke the climate system, and nations who have contributed the least suffer the most. The global north should take responsibility for it, pay reparations to the most affected, and finally stop with this fossil fuel madness. But we're not doing that. We're not even acknowledging our responsibility. We break it even more every month, every week, every day. This madness, this injustice is sometimes hard to grasp, hard to feel, because caring deeply can also hurt. Let me tell you a story why it is necessary to become loud, necessary to care. David and I, we met on the train to the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow, where leaders from all around the world came together in a high-security, airport-looking, cold conference complex and discussed the future of humanity. During the speech of the Austrian Chancellor, we looked at the conference complex from the outside, from the other side of the river. We listened to his speech with one ear on our smartphones. With the other ear, we listened to activists from all around the world. It sometimes felt like we were listening to the true leaders here. Fridays for Future MAPA activists. Activists from the most affected areas to most affected people. From nations who have contributed the least but suffered the most. They have told us that their countries are being destroyed by the climate crisis. They have told us that their livelihoods, their homes, are being flushed away in seconds. A 12-year-old activist from Colombia told us about the death threats he got because of his activism. It is a privilege to be able to protest without being scared for my life. It is a privilege to be able to choose if I want to care, if I want to become an activist. But knowing all these things, became a duty to become an activist, a duty to care. If you know that the climate crisis is unjust and it's urgent, then you have understood far more than most politicians and people in power have. Once you have understood this, you will probably ask yourself, well, what can I do? The most impactful way for you to tackle this crisis 
hasn't been invented yet because it needs to be invented by you. We need you with all of your personal interests, goals, hobbies, experiences, because the broken systems that led us into this crisis, colonialistic and paternalistic structures, fossil fuel lobbyists and corrupt politicians, they won't be the ones leading us out of this crisis. It will be all of us, and it needs you too. So whether you're a teacher, giving the climate crisis the attention it deserves at your school, or a journalist, reporting on the local, regional, national and international implications that this crisis already has today, or whether you simply become an ambassador for walking this path towards net zero, in your family, your friendship group, at work or at school, or most importantly, before your political leaders demanding political change. This crisis needs all of us. As Fridays for Future activists, we are often asked, well, what makes you hopeful? Hope is an emotion we didn't discuss at the beginning of our talk. And to be perfectly honest with you, I find hope a difficult emotion in connection to the climate crisis. The more I learn about this crisis and its implications, the more naive hope on its own seems to feel. How should I feel hopeful in times of crises? But there is also a different kind of hope. A kind of hope that starts to appear when people come together, create movements, form communities, and dream up utopias and turn them into reality. As we face the biggest crisis humankind has ever faced, hope alone isn't enough. We need to combine it with action, and to act, we need to care. To care. So let's start right here, right now. Hands up, who has been to a Fridays for Future strike before? Okay, a couple of people, good. So you all know how this is going to work. I will shout, who cares? You answer, we care. So, who cares? We care. Who cares? We care. What do we want? Climate justice. When do we want it? Now. So act. Now. Act. Now. Act, act, act. Now, now, now. Thank you very much.